Hello, uh, I hope you will hear me. Uh, I'm Martin and I will try to guide you a bit through the geospatial world within the Pandas ecosystem. My name is Martin Fleischmann and quickly, just briefly before we will, we will go through the code because I have a lot of code to show you. Who am I? Uh, I kind of stand on three legs, we can say. I'm a researcher, I'm coming from the university background, uh, I'm fellow at Geographic Data Science at the University of, university of Liverpool. I recently joined Urban and Regional Laboratory at Charles University here in Prague. Uh, during my research studies, research endeavors, I went a lot into open source, so for all the main head I have here to, today, tonight, is open source developer, and you will very soon uh, learn why and but generally I'm more data and data scientist that's kind of broad umbrella of, of all of these uh, and at the moment I lead the <coughs> data analytics team in a small Swiss startup called Urban Data Lab. Um, we'll be talking about uh, pandas ecosystem so whenever you do something with pandas you usually start like this import pandas SPD, that's a starting point for everything. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about spatial data. So the easiest situation with spatial data is something like this. You have a data frame with, let's say, cities around the world, and each of them has a coordinate. They are somewhere, right? So each of them has latitude and longitude in this case. And the main question here is, is this enough information? Is this, is this enough to work with? Is this the data structure good enough to actually deal with the spatial information? And the answer is, no, it's not. Uh, the, the paper from the light just fell off. <laughs> and we do have a package that tackles this kind of data type, and that's called GeoPandas. So, even though I mentioned in the, in the title that I will be talking about pandas ecosystem, I will actually mostly be talking about the geopandas ecosystem, uh, which simply just adds geo in front of pandas. In practice, it adds geo on top of pandas, and I want to show you how it's done and how you can use it in your own work. So if you read the same data with geopandas, instead of having two different columns for latitude and longitude, which you still can have, you have one which is called geometry usually, uh, and that contains something which is called point, and then it has the coordinates, which in practice is an array of geometries. And that's the key part of, of, of what GeoPandas is bringing to pandas. We deal with geometries in here. Uh, because geospatial world is slightly specific, I will, I will start with a short introduction, into, into a bit of theory, but I will try to make it super, super, super quick, and then we will jump to, to Jupyter Notebook and we, we will go through the code and see how it works. Uh, we can use a lot of words to, to describe this field. We can use geo, in the geopandas or geographic. A lot of people are using spatial or geospatial. It basically all means the same thing. Some people will say that spatial is like anything that war ha happens in space, while geographic needs to happen somewhere on Earth. Uh, this, 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 these boundaries are very, very vague, very, very blurry. And you can use geopandas for spatial data, for geospatial, geographic, whatever, whatever you like, essentially. Uh, we have two types of data in, in, the, in the geospatial world. The first one is our raster data. Uh, the typical example is the satellite imagery, for example. <coughs> satellite imagery is, is a, the raster is an array. If you have a uh, nice visible uh, image like this, the RGB colors, you have three bands, so you have three arrays. So it's 3D array, it can be 4D array, it can be ND array, generally speaking. But the underlying data structure in here is an array. So Usually it's NumPy array, it's quite often wrapped with X-Array, which makes it a bit, bit easier to work with. It can be different types of arrays, but still it's an array. It's not necessarily pandas, right? Well, pandas has arrays, but this, does, this kind of data structure doesn't really work within pandas very well. 
That's why we are not even talking about it today. Uh, we are going to talk about vector data. Uh, vector data are of generally speaking three types. It gets more complicated if you dig deeper, but generally speaking three types. We can talk about points, that's the city's location, latitude, longitude, essential x and y coordinate. You can have z, other coordinates, but x and y, we can stick to that. We can have lines which is a series of points connected with a straight line. Typical example, <coughs> river networks, road networks, stuff like this. And you can have polygons, which is a closed line string essentially, and that denotes that everything which is within, inside, is covering certain area, and that area is what I'm interested in. That could be, for example, a country and a second country, right? You have, you have, you have them as polygons, you don't draw just the boundaries, you also are interested in the area of that country itself. So these are the geometry types we are dealing with. We can then have the combinations if we have points, uh, multiple points denoting the same entity. You have multipoints, then you have multi-lines, multi-polygons, and you can combine them all together into geometry collections, but that's not a very common, common use case. So we're going to talk about vector. You're going to skip the raster data, Completely, if you are interested in raster, I would guide you towards uh, the Pangeo project or towards X-Array and, and stuff like this. Uh, but we're going to talk about vector. So back to GeoPandas. Uh, the main point of GeoPandas is not to essentially invent any new tool. It just tries to take everything which exists in the ecosystem uh, and try to glue it, to get, glue it together to create a really nice user-friendly API to all those geo-specific weird things that are happening somewhere under the hood on the sea level. So what do we need to actually make something uh, comfortable for user, something that works for all the use cases uh, and which does the, the dirty work for you? So what do we need to work with geospatial data in, in, in practice? The first thing you will usually need is to read something. So we need uh, to be able to read data that encodes some form of, of a geometry, and then you need to be able to, to write that type of data. Uh, geospatial data formats tend to be really weird in some cases, and there's a huge amount of them. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are open. And we need to be able to open all of them, essentially. So. <coughs> The first thing GeoPandas is doing in this kind of gluing interface is that it takes the libraries. One of them is, is fairly, fairly new, which is called PyAgrio, and the other one is fairly old, which is called Theona. And those two libraries, those two packages are designed to use a huge complex library written in C++ called GDAL, uh, and use it to open the files and read them as something Pandas ecosystem can understand. So that's the first thing. We take these two libraries and, and plug them in a simple, simple functions called read file. Uh, the second thing, probably the most, most important one, is the geometry itself. So when you read a file, you read it as a geometry array with the geometry D type. That's another thing GeoPandas is bringing to the ecosystem. But under the hood, all these, none of these geometries is essentially a GeoPandas object. It's Shapely geometry. We made this decision was made because Shapely has been around for 15 years, I think, right now. GeoPandas around nine, if I remember correctly. So we didn't want to invent anything new. We just tried to get, okay, this is working. This is dealing with geometries. We can expose it with another data frame. And Shapely, again, is a library that doesn't do the geospatial stuff on a Python level, but it essentially exposes a C API of another C++ library called Geos, which is Geometry Spatial Operations something something. <coughs> but it, like, again, it, it's not a library you want to deal with it directly. <coughs> uh, yes, one thing I want to mention in here so far, we've seen that all these coordinates are latitude, longitude, something we all have learned during geography at, at primary, secondary, high school. 
So we know how to kind of work with that. It works in Google Maps and everywhere. But not every geometry, and essentially most of them, are not encoded as latitudes and longitudes. But you get coordinates of this form. It's some abstract number. So what do we need to actually understand where this abstract number is, where these two coordinates, 1 million and something and 229,000, actually lies on, on, on Earth, we need to understand very nerdy thing which is called coordinate reference systems. Uh, before I explain what it is, uh, we again don't deal with it ourselves. We use another Python library, which is again exposing another C++ library called PyProy and Pro respectively. And we use the CRS uh, attribute, stands, which stands for coordinate reference system, and expose all this and use all the functionality. So you can see that by the description, the very quick description of the actual coordinate reference system used for those geometries with those weird numbers, uh, we have a geometry, we have a uh, CRS that is working very well in New York on Long Island. It's actually use, using US survey foot. It's in feet, so it's not in meters. The area of use is, is New York. So it's, it's designed specifically for New York. And it gives us uh, much more precise geometries. Because when we talk about uh, <coughs> coordinate reference systems, we are deal dealing with these things. Uh, Earth is essentially a sphere. It's not precisely a sphere, so it's even more complicated than that. But when we talk about uh, geospatial data, we usually have to work with them in 2D. We cannot work on a sphere. We can, but it's more expensive computationally. So what are we trying to do? is to pick one of these coordinate reference systems. Every single of them is, is, is a different one. Uh, and pick the one which works the best for our use case. Because when I'm dealing with <coughs> data in New York or in Prague, I don't care that the Earth is a sphere. I don't see it in here around. So I'm trying to find a way of uh, <coughs> essentially approximating the surface into a 2D and understanding all these things because you can imagine that in here on this corner, this is zero, zero. Over there would be something like 1 million and 500,000 coordinates. And every of these reference systems is kind of projecting the information in a different way. And we need a way to understanding and decoding that. And the final bit <coughs> uh, to, to handle properly Geospatial data are the data. And for those, we obviously use pandas. So the final data structure you will see when you use GeoPandas is a GeoPandas geodata frame. We like to stick geo in front of everything. So you have your pandas data frame with your indexing, with your, with, your, with your data, with all the functionality pandas data frame has. And we also have one or more geometry columns stick to that. So when you look whether the geopandas geodata frame is also pandas data frame, you get through because we are sub subclassing. And we're subclassing both data frame and series to get something called a geoseries. Uh, and this is essentially a, a very short diagram uh, I, I took from one of my papers, uh, which illustrates how the GeoPanas Geo ecosystem is built. So we have the C++ libraries in here, one for geometry, one for reading and writing, and one for the coordinate reference systems. Those are respectively uh, exposed in their Python wrappers. Then we have pandas. All of those are merged in GeoPandas. And GeoPandas is then serving as a geospatial library uh, on top of which other more specialized uh, tools are built. Uh, one of them is PySAL, and I will talk about PySAL, but there's plenty of, plenty of ad ad other, other use cases than that. So what can GeoPandas do? It's ideal to show as a code. So uh, I don't remember when I started, 
but I have a notebook which is roughly 90 minutes and then I have a second one which is about 40 minutes. So I will try to go through some, of, some parts of this. Uh, not everything. So this mouse doesn't... So you see that I haven't restarted my kernels. That's probably a good idea. I'm not. Uh, so uh, you're starting with importing pandas, geopandas. If you're reading files in pandas, often you're using read CSV, read parquet, whatever you have. Uh, we're going to use some data from, uh, from a course we teach at, at Liverpool. Uh, this one is uh, encoding some summary data for, from the census uh, for the output areas in Liverpool. So for each geography code, we don't have any ge geometry here. We have read it with pandas, uh, but we have uh, identifier which can link this information to a geometry. For, for each of them we have a count of people of different uh, different origin, different, different descent. So we have people who are coming from Europe, from Africa, Middle East, America, and Antarctic Ocean. Yeah. But this is pandas, doesn't give us any, any, any geospatial information. With geopandas we can use the read file to read different data set. And that, this gives us uh, cities from Spain, if I remember correctly. <laughs> uh, so, oh yeah, this gives us, the, this, this is the result of, of a research paper that was trying to identify the, the extent of different cities. So each city is not uh, encoded as, as a point, as we've seen before, but as a polygon. It's, 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 the area the city actually covers on the ground. And we see that, that, that we have, we have the, the, the polygons in here. Uh, the geometry column is indeed a geo series. This mouse is not very working. With the geometry D type, we have 700 polygons roughly. We can also write stuff by using two file and then specify one of many different geospatial, ge uh, geospatial file formats. I already showed you that we have uh, all geometries as shaped geometry polygons in this case. This is how the first one actually looks like. And this is the whole definition of the polygon if, if you want to write it as, as a well-known text. Uh, the projection of this one is a UTM zone. It's just, just, just a very, very specific portion of, of the Earth. One which works fairly well anywhere between Fairy Island, Fairy Islands, Ireland and Spain, kind of rough, rough, roughly covering that part of Europe. It's Piper Series and we can already use this because it's, it's fairly smart object to ask different questions about it. Uh, if I'm asking whether it is geographic, it means is it encoded as latitude and longitude? This one is not, so we get, we get false in here. Uh, but apart from this, what GeoPandas is doing is that it's essentially adding a bunch of geospatial specific methods on top of the standard pandas methods. So the very simple one, the easiest one would be we are interested in the area of each city. So we just get the area attribute of each polygon. Uh, GeoPandas has a concept of active and non-active geometry column. If you read a traditional geospatial file format, which usually has have one geometry column, that is automatically set as active. And when you uh, use geospatial specific uh, attribute, like this one, on the whole data frame, it passes it through to that active geometry. So if we had, uh, for example, for each of these cities, an area of a city which is denoted by its administrative boundary and the area which is denoted by its morphology, its actual physical extent, those would be different. But you can store both of them as different columns. And if you specify, say that this one, the administrative one is the active one, when you call the area, you get that one, you can switch it, or you can ask 
for four air of, of dif different columns, of different columns manually. Uh, we can also do some <coughs> uh, operations on the geometry level. So instead of trying to get a panda series of, of, of floats denoting areas, we can get another geo series. In this case, we are interested in the boundary of each polygon. So, oh, so instead of having the area, the, 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 the coverage essentially, we get only the line string on the edge of each of them. And we can also ask for centroid, which is essentially a point which is sort of trying to be in the middle of, a, of, of the polygon. I can probably skip this part to save a bit of time. Uh, just letting you know that you can obviously measure stuff like distances between different, different points or different polygons, lengths of, of lines, and yeah. But importantly, we are talking about spatial data, right? And I haven't showed any map. So GeoPandas has two ways of showing data spatially. The first one is using matplotlib to create static plots. So we can roughly see the outline of Spain in here, including the, the islands which belong to Spain. And we have also used the area we have measured before to, to, to highlight the the value, but these are a bit boring. So we have also developed an interactive way. I hope this mouse will actually work right now because I would really need it. So uh, this doesn't like me. I'll be right back. So you can see that, that we, we can actually interactively explore the whole geodata frame. And right now we have the geometries shown on a map. It doesn't matter which coordinate reference system it is originally, it gets projected and it's shown. Ideal, usually with, with some, some background map, you can pick whichever you like. And if we can, we also show the information for each of them. So those are the individual columns of, of, of data frame. And you can obviously use different styling for different values. Everything you, you would kind of know for, from uh, matplotlib can also be done interactively. And now I have to go back. Uh, I'll be right back again. <laughs> We can do the same thing with, with centroids, and now we, we can see that instead of all the, those very specific geometries denoting the extent, we have just, just points. And we can obviously plot one on top of each other. And I'm back again. <laughs> So this is just to show you the relationship between, between a centroid and its polygon. So you can see that it's roughly trying to be in the, in the center of each. But if you have very convex polygon, like a donut shape, for example, the centroid will lie outside of the polygon eventually. Oh, do, do, do you seen this? Have you seen this? This is, this is how I'm changing the, the, the active, active geometry column. Uh, the very important part of the spatial world are predicates. It's a very weird word. But what we are essentially trying to do is to understand the spatial relationship between two uh, geodata frames. So for example, what I have loaded in here right now is a toy data frame, geodata frame, uh, representing the countries of, of the world and some of the cities of the world, which in the end, looks something like this. So obviously countries in, 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 in blue and points of cities on, on top of that. And what I want to do, what I want to understand right now is which city belongs to which country, right? Because I may not have this information, but I have a spatial location. So I can use GeoPandas to very simply 
join these two informations or <coughs> to ask about different spatial relationships. So, for example, if I will take just Belgium out of the data frame and two cities, Paris and Brussels, and connect Paris and Brussels with a straight line, uh, we do have very small toy data, data set like this one. So we have Brussels, we have Belgium and we have Paris and the line connecting the two. So we can use GeoPandas to ask question, is Brussels within Belgium? Yes. Uh, does Belgium contain Paris? Well, Brussels, yes. Does it contain Paris? No. What is Belgium? Belgium is polygon. We know that. We, we, we've looked into that. Uh, does Belgium contains the whole line between Paris and, and, and Brussels? No. Do they intersect? Yes, they do, because part of the line crosses, crosses Belgium. Uh, we can skip these parts. We can go back to our Spanish cities. Uh, for example, we may be interested which of these Spanish cities belong to Catalonia and which of the regions in Catalonia they're actually belonging to. So if you lead the Catalonian data set, we get four polygons, actually multi-polygons, with different provinces, Barcelona, Girona, Tarragona, and, and Leida. Uh, you can quickly look how that looks like. I'm going back again. <laughs> so <coughs> we have the one part of, of Spain, different regions, and if we do the special join, you can skip this. Just need to make sure that our coordinate reference systems are the same. Do they equal yes? And if we join cities to Catalonia, we now see that on the very right side, we have now the province from the new data set we, we have just loaded and we also can explore this, these provinces, the cities within provinces using the interactive map again. And now here I'm, I'm, ju I'm just showcasing that you can change different, different background tiles if we wish so. I'm gonna skip this part and I think that I will slowly start tapping into the ecosystem of, of GeoPandas because as I mentioned GeoPandas is powerful by itself, but what makes it really important part of the vector geospatial world is that it's been around for a while and it's been fairly stable and fairly popular. So a lot of other libraries are building, building on top of that. So uh, we can, for example, uh, go back to the very, very first data frame I have read of the data in, in Liverpool. And we can, we can read the geometries for those. You can see that this is the, the ID we have seen before. Right now we have the geometry, but we don't have any information with it. So this is how the data frame looks like, just to give you a sense. Some polygons over, over Liverpool is one level of the, of the census, census hierarchy. Uh, we may be interested in encoding in some efficient way which of the polygons for, is a neighbor of which other polygon. To understand, okay, polygon A is next to polygon B, but it's not next to polygon C because there's the B in, the, in between of them. Uh, the data structure that deals with that is called spatial weights in spatial econometrics. It's practically a graph uh, in mathematical terms. And we use the libpycel library to generate these weights. Libpycel is the core module of a family of libraries called Pycel, which stands for Python Spatial Anal Analytics Library. Right now it's, I think, roughly 23 different 
more or less independent packages that fall under its umbrella and deal with anything from the spatial weights, which is a fairly simple thing, to spatial optimization, area interpolation, uh, spatial regression problems, and all these kind of fancy spatial statistics, spatial analytical tools. And all of it is, is essentially built on top of GeoPandas or it's kind of moving that direction. So if we build the spatial weights, in this case I'm using queen contiguity implementation, you can imagine a chessboard and every uh, cell of the chessboard queen can actually reach from, from, the, from, from, her, from its point. So you have, nine, uh, you have eight neighbors for each each cell which is not on the corner and just not to describe it very uh, abstractly uh, I'm gonna skip this, skip that and this, this is how it looks on the map so essentially what we can do in here is that for each polygon we can ask the weights object which of the other polygons are touching that one. This is somehow slow. And we can do this for every single of those, I think 700 polygons or how many we have. We can do also very fancy ways of building these. We can weight the importance of, of different neighboring polygons differently. Right now they are all treated the same. But this is very useful when you are trying to do any spatial statistics on top of that. So I'm going to skip these parts and I'm going to show you how you can use this information to understand whether where, where are different groups in, in, in Liverpool actually located, where there are some clusters where only certain groups tend to live. So I have merged the original data frame we had above, this one, with geographic code and the values to the one with geometries. So we now have this, which allows us to use the spatial waste matrix and allows us to plot these values and, allow, and, and it allows us to work with them in a, in a, in a spatial way. You'll do some transformation of ways. I'm not going to go into those details. But the very simple way of asking a question whether certain groups tend to locate at certain places, which are different than for other groups, is to measure something which is called a spatial lag. It sounds complicated, but in principle, it's a mean of values from the neighboring polygons. So try, I'm trying to smoothen the, 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 the actual value. And when you plot uh, when you plot these two as a scatter plot, like this one, <laughs> you have the original observations on the, on the <coughs> x-axis, the number of people living in each polygon. And on y-axis, you have the mean of the population for from Middle East and Asia living in the neighboring polygons. And if you see something like this, which <laughs> indicates that there is quite a strong relationship, it means that the people are probably trying, tending to cluster, cluster together in a city. And we can use another part of the PySol family, which is called ESDA, which stands for Exploration, uh, Exploratory Spatial Data Analysis, uh, to measure spatial statistics called local Moran's I. Which, a, which is a local indicator of spatial autocorrelation. It's a bit mouthful. But we can essentially use the, use the class fairly straightforward way on top of our data. Uh, and <coughs> what we get back are labels for four quadrants of the Moran's plot. Uh, it essentially means uh, whether the polygon tends to be next to other polygon with higher high values, so it's high and high. What other is whether we have low and low, so no one from that group lives here and no one from that, from that group lives around. And then we have 
I have the one polygon has very high value, but the neighboring have very low values, and the other way. And this can be easily mapped as as labels like this, and then shown on a map. I'm also uh, using the simulated p-value to to get the significance of this of this relationship, because not everything is actually significant. But this is the result for, for the data in Liverpool. What it tells us is that in the city center of Liverpool, which is in here, and in the area around the University of Liverpool, which is in here, uh, there's a much higher uh, proportion of people from Middle East and Asia than in other areas of Liverpool. And we can say the other way for the peripheral areas of Liverpool, these in, 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 in light blue. We can say that, we can significantly state that much less people from this origin live in those areas. One interpretation for that is that the University of Liverpool has very strong relationship with a specific university in China, and they have a mixed degrees, which means that Chinese people have to go and spend one year of their masters in Liverpool, which means that there is a huge student community in the areas near the, near the, the university, which is in the end creating cluster of, of, of this sort. But there's just one possible interpretation of what's, what's happening in there. You can also check how the proportion itself looks on on a map without those clusters. You can see that <laughs> if, if, we, if we get the value normalized by the area of the, of the polygon, you can see that I think that somewhere in here would be the, the student housing. Okay. We can also do some other fancy things with this, but we're gonna skip that. I can probably skip aerial interpolation. Oh, maybe not. What aerial interpolation is doing is that assume that you have your data on two different geometries. So you have, for example, tracts in the US and you have precincts in the US. If you're gonna look how these actually look like on a map, we see that uh, there is a certain overlap between the two, but the blue and red boundaries actually do not coincide. And if you want to do some analytics, some, some data stuff on top of these, and you have part of the, your data on the red ones and the other part on the blue ones, you somehow need a way of, of, of moving one to the other. Uh, the most straightforward way of doing that is to use interpolation, which means that you look at the proportions, let's say, of the blue ones, which fall into the area of every, every red one, and you <coughs> move the uh, part of the, of the values, which kind of re reflect that area to the other, other, other polygon. You can do this in, in a more robust way if you have some other information on top of that, for example, land cover. So you know that you are working with population data, so that the people are not living in lakes or, or, or on, on, on the national tree park. So you can use this information to kind of guide, guide the interpolation to, to, for example, use the information of, of, of buildings and say, okay, I want to interpolate between these two polygons but I want to make, take into account where the buildings actually are, so I'm not interpolating people somewhere on the desert. And where are we? So we can just simply make sure that the coordinate reference systems, again, are the same. That's kind of recurring topic in the geospatial world and do the interpolation and now we will see that we have moved different information from one to the other as we did before in the, in the Catalonia case, but right now we have 
interpolated in, 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 in a smarter, smarter way. Uh, I will try to wrap it quickly. So I will skip this one and I will show you uh, a sub-project of GeoPandas, uh, which is called Dusk GeoPandas, which tries to use the infrastructure of Dusk uh, to do the, this kind of spatial operations in parallel. And in spatial war, this is more important than in normal non-spatial, because spatial operations tends to be more expensive. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Dusk, Dusk is a tool for advanced parallelism in, in Python and enables even out-of-core computation or distributed computation on cloud clusters and fancy stuff like this. It's essentially, essentially a framework to uh, bring more performance and to actually chew through the big data in, in, in Python, and one of the key modules of, of Dusk is Dusk Data Frame, which is designed to scale pandas. What we do with Dusk GeoPandas is exactly the same thing as we did with pandas in GeoPandas. Uh, and we take the Dusk Data Frame object and extend it with GeoPandas geospatial capabilities, which means that in the end, when we create, a, a, in this case, lazy object, lazy uh, geodata frame with four partitions, because I think I have four performance core on this, on this MacBook, uh, we can measure stuff like length of the polygon in four parallel chunks. So we have split, split the data frame into four parts, and each of them is then processed separately, and this is the diagram showing how it's gonna be, how it's gonna be done. Uh, we can do the same with centroids as we did before, and you can see again how it kind of all flows through the, through the diagram. Uh, the, the good thing about Dusk is that you create this task graph lazily, so nothing is executed apart from creation of the task graph, and then you have to call compute to actually say, tell, tell Dusk, do something now. And, and usual, usually this means that you are t telling to your cloud infrastructure, read all those files, do something, and save them. That's kind of the, the typical, typical use case. How fast this can be, we can check quickly if I create 10 million of random points and a very simple uh, geometry, and I can check which of these points are within this, this, this box, this geometry, and if I check it with, with GeoPandas, it takes about 280 milliseconds. If I check the same thing with Dusk GeoPandas with four partitions on a MacBook Air uh, with M1 chip, which I don't know how many cores it actually has, uh, we drop to, to 60 milliseconds. So you see that even on, on, a, on a single laptop, there can be significant, significant speed up of, of, uh, of performance. Not everything works right now, because parallelizing spatial operations tends to be a bit more complex than some, some other things, because you, can, you cannot just split the geospatial uh, polygons into different parts and treat them separately because there's a relationship between them and you often have a relationship between many different partitions and it can get complex and expensive and in the end it can run slower than if you run it single core with GeoPandas. But we're trying to, to get through that and, and, and make sure that you can use geospatial stuff on your Dusk infrastructure as you would use GeoPandas. And we hope that tools like PySA will actually build on top of that as well. Uh, I will use five more minutes and I will talk about the, I don't see the sidebar in here. 
I will talk about one very specific use case which brings all this together and that's uh, MomPy, which is another uh, package from the PySal family, but this one is not aimed at general, general geospatial processing, but is designed to understand urban environments and it's designed to analyze cities. I'm going to open another notebook, which I for some reason don't see. I just couldn't see the sidebar in here. <laughs> and then I'm going to scroll through this one. This is a notebook which takes GeoPandas and the ecosystem. You see the LibPy cell is here. You see the pandas is obviously there and, and some, and some other, other, other tools. And what it does is that it geocodes where Znojmo is, which is a town in, in, in Czech Republic. We so we just simply say, this is the name. And we ask GeoPandas where this place actually is. So we get the coordinates back. And you can see that this is the location where, where, the, where the town is. We use a library called OSMNX to load the data directly from OpenStreetMap. So we can work with the geometries which are making OpenStreetMap. I'm, gonna, gonna, I'm not going to run this, but we are lo loading buildings and we are loading streets and doing some cleaning pre-processing on top of that to make sure that we have clean data set. Like here. Then we take the buildings and we generate something called a morphological tessellation, which is a spatial unit, which is in principle Voronoi tessellation based on polygons. So you discretize the, the, the boundary of each polygon into points, create Voronoi, and then merge it all back together. And this is very useful because it gives us a lot of information about which of these buildings, for example, that are somewhere in here, are neighboring which, because they're not touching and we don't have any information of, from the cadaster. It, it's, it's, it's often not available or it's encoding something in a very, very dirty way or some actual plots are drawn as, as four plots. And in Czech Republic, it works fairly well. In Switzerland, it works okay. In France, it's rubbish. And in the UK, half of them, them are missing. So we developed something like something called morphological isolation to kind of surrogate the role of, 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 of cadastral information. And we create it on, the, on Znoimo. We link all the stuff together. But then we can use GeoPandas to measure different things about the structure of the city. So we measure the areas, we measure the length of streets, and then we measure stuff uh, which is decoding the shape of individual buildings or shape of these underlying geomet geometries giving us the, the spatial unit. And we can start seeing some, some patterns emerging in here. So for example, in the, in the city center of Znojmo, we have uh, polygons that tend to be, have a weirder shapes. Or yeah, other, other stuff. We can also ask about how many, the, the relation between different buildings, how many walls they actually share when they, they, there is no window and, and stuff like that. Again, city center is kind of popping up. But we can do many, 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 many of these measurements trying to understand every single aspect of the city, to understand the connectivity of street network, understand the relationship between the buildings, understand the context of, of, of every single of them, trying to actually turn information like this, which is fairly noisy, but there seems to be some pattern into that pattern, trying to, the, 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 the image on the right is actually kind of translation, spatial translation of this one. And then making all that into a clustering exercise, which in the end identifies the individual types of development in this particular town. So we have the historical core, we have some kind of industrial development of the industrial era, then we have the actual the industrial zone of, of, of today, 
some smaller developments in, in, the, in different parts. I'm showing this just to give you an illustration how can GeoPandas and its ecosystem be useful in, in, in practice. How can you take all these parts and, and combine them into something which gives you an answer to some question. So this is, this is one of the answers. This is, this is an illustration from uh, one of the conference. Says, uh, and we tried to find out what are the different types of urban development, given we have no other information about the, the, the city apart from the map, from OpenStreetMap. So we can use this to look, for example, into energy performance of different development types. And then we can tr translate this into uh, master planning and into legislation to guide, for example, sustainable development of, of, of existing cities. So with that, uh, the demo time is over and my talk is over. Thank you. <laughs>